بسم الله والحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلله فلا فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ولا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وبيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير والصلاة والسلام على محمد النبي الأمين خاتم المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم ما أستغفرك ربي وأتوب إليك إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Today is the 27th of Rajab, which according to the more established opinions and better proven positions is the occasion for Al-Isra'i wal Maraj. <coughs> Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, a momentous occasion in Islamic history that we often repeat but insufficiently reflect upon its many lessons. The time of the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca had become increasingly desperate. The persecution of Meccans against the believers has intensified to unbearable levels. The followers of Muhammad ﷺ were subject to an economic boycott and those of them that were not members of an aristocratic family were even grabbed and tortured and beaten and life for Muhammad and his followers has become a desperate struggle for existence. And it was at that time, during these days, shortly before the Hijra, in the events leading up to the Hijra from Mecca to Medina, that Abu Talib, the Prophet's uncle, dies leaving the Prophet himself without a protector because in Mecca society a member of the aristocracy would have to claim guardianship over you in the sense put you under the auspices of their political protection and if you did not have that political protection, you were fair game to all those who wish to target you. And with, with the death of Abu Talib, it meant that the affairs of the Prophet ﷺ would have to go through his other aristocratic members of Quraysh, namely Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, who of course 
were more than happy to give a license to their fellow Meccans to target the Prophet as they wish. And at that time, and in the same year known in Islamic literature as the year of sadness, on the Khuzm, the Prophet ﷺ loses his beloved wife Khadija. She had played a decisive role in supporting the message of Islam and had played a decisive role in protecting the weaker members of the Muslim community, the members who were not from aristocratic and prestigious families, including a very large scale of former slaves who were once slaves and then they were bought and freed by their fellow Muslims. Often Khadija spent much of her wealth buying the freedom of Muslim slaves and setting them free, but after being set free, that did not mean that they had the political leverage that allowed them to exist in safety. And in that same year, Khadija passes away. And the impact of the loss of his uncle and the loss of his wife was enormous upon our prophet. And it was in that same year that acting upon revelation from Allah to escape their persecution by leaving Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ makes a trip to Ta'if, the home of a very famous poet, for those of you who love Arabic poetry, <laughs> and his attempt to reach Ta'if and ask them for protection was horrible. He was beaten severely and left bleeding after his attempt to reach out to Ta'if and his persecution got to a point that it produced the famous dua the Prophet uttered at the time. O oh Allah, who do you leave me to? Who would you leave me to? Without you, I cannot escape the oppression and the persecutors. While the Prophet ﷺ anchored himself in his belief that in his belief that Allah is his aid and supporter, his ally, his everything. But at the same time, there was an Islamic principle being anchored for all the generations to follow. You cannot tolerate oppression and you cannot allow yourself to exist as an oppressed people, as a broken people, as a demoralized people. Allah has created humanity, human beings, and endowed them with dignity, the right to dignity. And if you exist oppressed, and your dignity is stolen, and you are robbed of your dignity, that is not consistent with what Allah has created to you for. And you must do everything within your powers to reclaim your dignity. 
and to escape your oppression and resistance. During this year of sadness, in which one calamity befalls Muslims and after another, and especially the Prophet ﷺ, here was a time where the Isra and Mi'raj, the journey from Mecca to Jerusalem and the Aqsa Mosque, the groundwork for it is being laid because what will follow is a turning point in Islamic history and indeed a turning point in Islamic morality and Islamic belief. Muslims are tested to the limit and persecuted and enduring one hardship after another. Allah knows in the divine knowledge that soon Muslims will be migrating to Yathrib, what becomes Medina, and establishing the premises for a Muslim polity and a Muslim society. And that this step, this step, requires a new foundation, a new constitutional anchoring, a new paradigm where Muslims who are weak of faith must be tested and allowed to leave if they do not have the faith to wither away their persecution and their oppression. But those Muslims who understand the meaning of the right to dignity, right to autonomy, right to freedom, right to self-determination, are going to embark upon a great project, and that is the project of the Muslim state in Medina. So during that time is where we have the revelation and the unfolding of the Isra and Naraj. Subhanallah Asra bi Abdi min al Majjid al Harami ila al Majjid al Aqsa al Ladi barakna hawla. Praise be to God who has journeyed, who has journeyed the Prophet from the Masjid al Haram in, in Mecca, we don't need to get into all the reports about where he exactly was and which home and which, whether it's Khidr Hajar Ismail, all of that is not material for us right now. But journeyed from Al Masjid al Haram to the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And from the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, to the realm of the unseen and unknown, to the, from Alam al-Jabarut, to the world of material existence, to the plane of divine presence, Alam al-Malakut. It's a transcendental moment and a test of faith because imagine, if you will, put yourself in their shoes. You are enduring maximum persecution. And then, at that time, the prophet that you follow tells you something that will truly test the faith. He will make an enormous claim. And the claim is that he journeyed but in a single night from Mecca to Jerusalem in Masjid al-Aqsa, that blessed area and blessed plot of land that Allah has chosen throughout the legacy of the Abrahamic prophets to play a critical role in educating humanity and in attaining salvation. And the Prophet ﷺ will make that claim and to have even ascended 
to the planes of the heavens, the plane of the unseen in the world in a plane that the material world has not experienced and will not experience and will, pro and will unfold to them after the, after the, the journey on this earth expires. In, in other words, after they go to the hereafter. Now, we have many reports. It was a decisive moment. Some, well, before I get it, first, the reaction of the Meccans. The reactions of the Meccans who were persecuting the Prophet and his followers jeered and sneered and laughed and said, look, look at this, look at your Prophet is claiming he traveled in but one night and he's claiming that he ascended to the heavens. It was a moment where you had to critically either accept that this is a prophet revealing revelation and, in, and commit to a faith without reasonings, without material explanations. In other words, a matter of pure faith and conviction. I believe you not because I am capable of experiencing what you experienced, Muhammad. I believe you because I know that you speak the truth. Period. All those, by the way, and all those modern Muslims, contemporary Muslims, who sit there and try to prove parallels between quantum physics and uh, travel at the speed of light and Surah al Isra al Ma'raj, they lose the point completely. The Isra al Ma'raj was a moment of investment of pure faith. Not a moment of unfolding of scientific reasoning. So all attempts to try to reconcile between science and an Isra al Miraj, I see it as truly misguided. Other than the Meccans who sneered and cheered and laughed, there were some Muslims who that was the breaking point for them. They left the faith. And we have stories of many of them. Said, okay, you know, enough persecution and... But it was a necessary cleansing to distinguish those who are weak Muslims from those who are anchored and resolute Muslims. Because what Muslims are going to be asked to do next is historic and requires an enormous sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, we are invested in our material possessions and we have the hardest time parting with what we've become attached to materially. Well, those early Muslims were not just persecuted, but within a year they were going to be given a command to leave everything they owned in life and everything they knew in life to immigrate and establish an entirely new existence in Yathrib, Medina. They didn't, most of them, were unable to go to Medina or Yathrib with, with their material positions because Meccans wouldn't allow them. Meccans said you can leave if you want but you take nothing with you. You leave, but you leave behind everything you own. Your cattle, your gold, your money. And that was an enormous test, an enormous sacrifice, because many of us will give anything but the thing we love most, and that's money. That's where the true test is for most people. You part with anything. You're willing to give time, but not money. You're willing to give health, but not money. And those Muslims had to leave everything behind and go be migrants, refugees, in a city without resources and without power 
a city that had been weakened by decades of civil war. The Isra al Naraj was a cleansing moment for the Muslim community. And a moment where you test the strength of the, the metal of Muslims because they are about to embark upon changing the history of humankind. Before Muslims embark on their, their go, before Muslims are obligated to embark on their hijra and establish a new historic moment where they establish the city-state out of nothing. Refugees, displaced human beings, who have lost all their material possessions. <coughs> they needed to have, or that state needed to be built upon the shoulders of men and women with unwavering faith. <coughs> and that's the role that the Isra al Maraj played. But beyond that, and Isra al Maraj affirmed something that all of us must ponder and reflect upon consistently. Yes, the Ba'tha of Muhammad, Nabiullah, Khatab al Nabiyin, Al Sharif al Amin, yes, the Ba'tha, the message of Muhammad comes from Arabia and from Mecca, but it is umbilically and invariably weaved in and connected to and part of the legacy of the Abrahamic prophets from Ibrahim to Isa to Musa, all the prophets of monotheism, of Tawheed. And the symbolic place for all the prophets of Tawheed is Jerusalem. And his ascension from Mecca to Jerusalem to the heavens is to establish that although we are going to create a state, this polity is not about an ethnic affiliation, it is not about a tribal affiliation, it is not about a clan. We are not establishing this polity in the name of Arabism we're not establishing it in the name of some other tribe or clan or ethnicity or race. It is not going to be a city-state that fights against the Persians as an ethnic group or fights against the Assyrians as an ethnic, ethnic group. No, this polity is umbilically connected to the entire message from Adam to Ibrahim to Isa to Musa. In other words, Mecca and later on Medina and Jerusalem are part of a triangle of the monotheistic faith, Tawheed. And I, I can go on for hours about the, the, the significance of this, the number three. The, the, this, this triangle of faith between Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. It is the affirmation of who Muslims are. 
We are not about some new religion that comes to humanity without precedent. We are not about a marginal path or one path among many possible paths. We are about the singular path of Allah, the past of the Prophet Ibrahim والسلام, and the Prophet Isa والسلام, and the Prophet Musa والسلام, and all the Prophets that came from Ibrahim to Muhammad. Now brothers and sisters, I must tell you that every time the Isra and Mi'raj comes and as we prepare for the months of Rajab and Sha'ban, which will be followed by Ramadan, insha'Allah, you meet the, we should, we, uh, we should honor the memory of Al Isra and Mi'raj by extended prayers and extended dhikr. You know, many countries back home, they, they take the day off and they eat a lot of food, but it's not the way you honor Al Isra and Mi'raj. You honor Isra wa Ma'raj by reading Surah Al Isra and reflecting and praying. Now, let me comment, if you will, about Surah Al Isra, which is the affirmation of this momentous occasion. The very first verses of Surah Al Isra praises Allah for this miraculous event telling us, of course, that within the power of Allah, miracles are possible. And miracles are a matter of faith and conviction. They're not subject to the laws of the material world. But right after the introductory verses, what does Surah Al-Isra talk about? It talks about Allah's message to the Israelites and the building of the temple in Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, as we know, destroyed by the Romans, and the rebuilding of the temple and the redestruction of the temple. It is Allah telling us what, what I believe Omar understood, Omar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, the, the Prophet's companion, understood very well, and leave alone the, 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 the various reports about the discussions between him and Abu, between Omar and Abu Bakr about this, but understood very well that the temple is claimed by an ethnicity and a racial group that are called the Israelites. But if you reflect upon Surah Al-Isra, Allah is telling Muslims that, because Allah knows what history will unfold, and the way things will become. This is not what the site of the temple and the site of Masjid Al-Aqsa is about. It is not about an ethnicity. It's not about a race. It is not about the tribe owning that plot of land and claiming that it is theirs. It is about monotheism and tawheed. And that is why the Prophet ascends to the heaven from Jerusalem. Now when Isra and Maharaj comes other than dhikr, I always reflect upon the state of Muslims and where they are vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem. It is a shame and an embarrassment and something all of us will be held responsible for in the hereafter when Allah tells us, where is the role of Muslims in Jerusalem and in Masjid al-Aqsa? And we say, well, you know, we just busied ourselves with Medina and Mecca, and we broke the triangle and betrayed the triangle of faith. We have no aspiration and interest in Jerusalem anymore. This is how the leaders of Muslims are acting. 
you, it doesn't even make them consider, reconsider their economic policies or any policies to assert and demand our rights as Muslims in Jerusalem. It reminds me of a famous Iraqi faqih when Jerusalem was occupied by the Crusaders who came in the middle of Ramadan and broke his fast. And he was a very distinguished faqih. He was a very famous and famous Hanafi faqih. And people were scandalized. What are you doing breaking your fast in the middle of Ramadan? And they brought him before a qadi. And he yelled at the qadi, we all live in a state of sin when we have We, we, when we have uh, wasted, when we have a dishonored, this is the correct word, dishonored Allah's sunnah and Allah's command and Allah's system of connections relating and connecting umbilically Muslims to Jerusalem we all exist in a state of sin. Compared to that, you are asking me why, why, why I broke fast in the middle of Ramadan? I broke fast to shame you, to tell you if you are holding me responsible for breaking the fast in the middle of Ramadan, I'm holding you responsible for not doing anything about Jerusalem. We cannot, and this is you know, Allah has a fate for each of us. Some of you will struggle paycheck to paycheck until you pass and leave away this and leave this world. Some of you, Allah will bestow bounties upon you and make you very rich. Some of you might already be very rich and hiding your money. Those of you who are truly tested are those who are actually going to be successful. And those of you who will be given the bounties and the money. Because with wealth, every occasion in which Isra and Maraj comes around in the 27th of Rajab, remember that Allah will ask you, what have you done with this wealth <laughs> to liberate and to establish Muslim rights over Jerusalem. Allahumma afu anna. Allahumma akhfir lana. Allahumma aslih lana amrana. Waslih lana dinana alladhi huwa ismutu amrina. Waslih lana dunyana allati fiha maashuna. واصبح لنا آخرتنا التي فيها معادنا الله الله bless us and forgive our sins الله enlighten our past so we can see the truth of your faith الله allow us the power to honor the the faith of Adam and Ibrahim and Jesus and Musa and all the prophets until Muhammad al-Khatam al-Amin. Welcome to Salah.